Good evening and welcome to the May 21st regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting. At this time, as a point of order, if you would check your cell phones and turn them completely off, not just silent. Many times the R our RF feed um, gets interference from cell phones. So if you could do that for us, that would be wonderful. And also, if you would stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you. First, Secretary McFarland, could you please take attendance? Yes, uh, that was great to hear everybody say the pledge, especially young kids with us tonight. That was uh, really a nice, <laughs> nice thing. Okay, President Singer. Here. Vice President Branstad. Here. Treasurer Frizee. Member Baker. Here. Member Blazy. Here. Member Friedel. Here. We have a quorum. Very good. Thank you. We will move right into our consent agenda. We have items 2.1 to 2.4. Are there any items you would like to remove from the consent agenda? Seeing none, I would uh, entertain a motion to uh, accept the consent agenda. I'll move to approve the consent agenda items 2.1 through 2.4 as listed on the agenda. Support. We have a move by Mr. McFarland and support by Mrs. Branstadt. Is there any, um, at this point, we will take a vote. All in favor of approving consent agendas, item 2.1 through 2.4, <coughs> say aye. 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 All opposed? And the consent agenda passes unanimously. We'll move into Board of Education matters, presentations to the board. Um, I'll hand this over to Mr. Shiro. Our first shining star of this month is not with us, but she sent a letter in, so I'm going to read uh, a little bit about her, and then I'll read the letter as well. Our first shining star is Wendy Thomas. Wendy began her MPS career in 1999 as a teacher in the Juvenile Care Center, a position she continues to fill today. She earned her Bachelor's of Science degree from Central Michigan University in 1996. In 2000, Wendy earned her Master's of Arts degree in Special Education from CMU. You may remember that Wendy was named an Excellence in Education Award recipient from TV5 in the Michigan Lottery just this past March. When he was nominated for a shining star by an MPS community member, among their comments were the following. Wendy has been a Midland Public Schools teacher in the day treatment program for many years. The youth, 12 to 17 years old, both from middle and high schools. They are court ordered to attend the school in the day treatment program. Needless to say, students can, these students can be some of the most difficult youth with challenging behaviors in the school learning <coughs> environment. Nevertheless, Wendy never judges her students. She's encouraging and supportive to all students. She makes the time to meet individually with students and make them feel she cares for them. She goes out of her way to ensure their basic needs are met. She treats her students with respect and they in turn respect her. She's, she has a long way of using humor to cheer up her students and help them deal with many stressors in their lives. Last fall, she wrote a grant to provide all the students and their families with a Thanksgiving basket that included a turkey and all the fix, fixings. Wendy and her students also planned and cooked a Thanksgiving meal for all the students and families. Wendy, Tom Wendy Thomas is wor worthy of earning the NPS Shining Star. And this is what Wendy wrote back um, since she could not be here this evening. Thank you, Midland Public Schools Board of Education and Superintendent Cheryl. I would like to extend a heartfelt thank you for the distinguished honor of being nominated for the Shining Star Award earned by employees in Midland Public Schools. It has been a pleasure to work at the Midland County Juvenile Care Center for the past 20 years, and I'm proud to be an employee in this well-respected district. It is a blessing to get up each morning and look forward to going in to my job, for which I truly am passionate. I've had the unique opportunity to spend my career and make a difference in the lives of some of the most at-risk students in our district. I apologize for not being in attendance this evening as my children are very involved in Midland High School and Northeast Middle School Athletics, and both of them have important events this evening. I accept this honor with the greatest appreciation for Midland Public Schools and look forward to seeing many more years as an educator in the district. Sincerely, Wendy Thomas. Since that one was a little different without Wendy here, um, this one's going to be a little different because we're going to honor two people as well. Um, and if they would join me up here, Ron Potter and Eric Smith, come on up. 
And as Ron and Eric come up, I'm going to read a little bit about why they were nominated and, um, and about the two gentlemen. Ron joined the MPS technology team in 2012 and Eric in 2008. They are our workstation technicians in the MPS technology help desk. Ron and Eric do a great job of answering student, staff, parent questions and diagnosing, troubleshooting, and resolving staff and student computer issues for us. Ron and Eric were nominated for the Shining Star by two MPS staff members. Among their comments were the following. Eric and Ron both work at the help desk. They are very friendly and exhibit excellent customer service for, for the two of them. It is not just about getting the issue fixed, but do it in a manner that is respectful, responsive, and competent. I recently had some computer problems, which I was not able to fix on my own. Eric and Ron both responded and solved the problem. They explained their solution in terms that, that were customer friendly, and I was on my way to work on a device that worked faster and more efficient, efficiently. In addition, in the last two years, I've had many comments from teachers across the district about the friendliness and responsiveness of this outstanding team. The service provided by the help desk has been exceptional. Ron and Eric dig in and get it done to find out who can do so. The turnaround time and level of accuracy have been amazing. Both gentlemen deserve to be recognized for their incredible efforts towards customer service. Congratulations, Ron and Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I'm going to move right into uh, the presentation to the board. Yeah, they were wondering if they had all their students, but they do have them here, so we're going to awesome. let uh, Central Park come up and present. And I think Jen Service is leading the group, or Bridget is? Just for a minute. Okay, you got it. us here tonight. We are here to not only celebrate the awesome accomplishments of our Central Park students, but also to recognize the hard work and dedication put in by our Central Park teachers and staff this year. At the beginning of the year, our huge task was to combine two schools, two IB PYP programs of in inquiry, and work to pilot and infuse PLTW into our units of inquiry. Teachers worked countless hours to create, prepare, and design meaningful and relevant units. These units offered new learning engagements for our students and sparked an interest in a new STEM curriculum. It has been an absolute privilege to work and collaborate with a very talented and dedicated staff this year. Teachers at Central Park have been true leaders in this district as Project Lead the Way has unfolded. They have been very creative and innovative when looking for cross-curricular connections. This year, our building piloted four PLTW modules in every grade level, and many Central Park teachers led district PD sessions for the rest of the elementary staff in the district. It has been truly a year of learning, a year of making many mistakes along the way, but growing as educators, growing as a staff, and growing as a school community. I stand here proud of the accomplishments of our new building and would like to share some of our celebrations with you tonight. Our year of firsts, a new school program of inquiry, a new PLTW STEM curriculum, a brand new building, a brand new pilot robotics team, a first PYP fifth grade exhibition, and so much more. I have some friends here tonight that would like to share part of their journey with you. So to begin, I would like to introduce two of my first grade friends. They are currently working on their unit of inquiry, how we express ourselves. They have learned that stories have elements that are interconnected to engage their audience. Students have been able to incorporate their PLTW animated storytelling and hope to share that with you tonight. Here to tell you more are my friends Maddie and Reagan. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Maddie Wolf. I'm a student from Miss Cooper's first grade class. Our first grade class wrote fairy tales. My fairy tale was The Three Little Unicorns and the Big Bad Wizard. Then we coded our fairy tale using Scratch Jr. I had to create a wizard and three unicorns. I'm going to be showing you the scene. Reagan, I am in Miss Cooper's first grade class. My fairy tale. was called Reagan and the Big Bad Book. First I typed the story and then I started to code. At first, coding can be hard and frustrating, but when you get used to it, it's not that bad. I'll show you my story. It might help you get some better ideas of it. Thank you, ladies. Next, I would like to introduce two second grade students. This grade level is currently working on their Sharing the Planet PYP unit. Students have been able to incorporate their PLTW material science form and function module within this unit, looking through the lens of interdependence. Here to tell you more are Storm and Alexis. Hi, my name is Storm. Hi, my name is Alexis. We are second graders in Miss Kretz's class at Central Park. And our P PLTW unit, Material Science Form and Function, fit with our PYP unit, Sharing the Planet. We studied how living things depend on one another. We learned all about seeds and how they grow and travel. In our final project, we had to create a seed disperser device. I made a double slingshot that seeds can travel to different places. I learned sometimes your first design might not work, then you have to find ways to fix it. And if you can't, you might have to change your idea. For my design, I created a cup on top of a plate with holes in it. So when you drop the seeds in the cup, they will fall through the holes and into the dirt. I learned that seeds sometimes can't travel by themselves, so they need help. We learned that in order to share the planet, living things need to help one another. We hope, hope you, you have, have a great night. night. <laughs> Our next team is from third grade. This grade level is working on their How the World Works unit. They were able to connect this unit with the PLTW module, Stability in Motion, Forces and Interactions. These students have learned the impact of scientific and technological advances on society. Here to tell you more are Connor and Donovan. Hi, my name is Connor. Hi, my name. Hi, my name is Donovan. Is it right here? We are third grade. We are third graders. We are third graders at Central Park in Miss Struble's class. In our PYP unit, we how the, war, the world works. We had a problem to solve. A tiger fell into a moat, and we had to rescue it. In this unit, we learned about compound machines. So my group decided to rescue the tiger using a forklift. Our first idea didn't work. We weren't able to reach the bottom of the moat. So we had to problem solve and try a new design. We added string to the edges of our platform to make the forklift, make the forklift long enough to reach the bottom of the moat. This model worked, and we were able to save the tiger. My group created a, a crane to save the tiger. Our first design did not work because we weren't able to lift the tiger four inches off the ground. My team tried to, a few other ideas that didn't work, but finally we decided to make a pulley to lift the tiger out. I learned that it's important to look at work as a group and brainstorm ideas. I also learned that it's important to be nice when other people are sharing, are, people share ideas. I learned to listen to other people's design ideas to see if we could add 
ideas to, to make it even better. Thank you. And next we have members of our first FLL Junior Robotics team at Central Park. Please welcome Spencer and Selena to tell you about their aqua adventure. Hi, my name is Spencer. Hi, my name is Selena. We are second graders at Central Park, and we are members of the first FLL Junior Robotics team at Central Park. Our team's name was Lego, Lightn Lego Lightnings Junior. <laughs> Our theme was Aqua Adventures. We worked as engineers to build a model to show a way that we could help the water travel from one place to another. Our team decided to build a pool and a splash park. Our goal is to keep the dirty water out of the pool. In one of the, our first meetings, we learned that most of our water in Midland comes from Lake Huron. One of my favorite parts of being on the robotics team was programming the pump. The first thing we had to do was send a message from our computer to the pump to tell it to start. We also programmed a buzzer in our system. So if the pump had dirty water in it, the buzzer would go off and the pump stopped. The robotics was really fun and I want to do it next year. You should join. <laughs> It was really cool to be in the first Lego Robotics Club at Central Park. I liked being able to work with a team, and the, at the competition, our team won the Inkering Minds Award. I want to be in robotics time in fifth grade. I learned that robotics can be for boys and girls. Thank you. And finally tonight, fifth grade exhibition. Currently, our fifth grade students are inquiring into different environmental issues, exploring ways that they can take action and make a difference in our world. Here to share their exhibition journeys so far are Abby and Catherine. And they just came from a fifth grade music uh, orchestra choir band concert, but they're here. <laughs> Hi, my name is Abby. I'm a fifth grader at Central Park in Ms. Ahern's class. We are in the process of our first exhibition at Central Park. We are working under the PIP theme, How We Express Ourselves. A central idea is through small actions, everyone can make an impact. My group is studying animal testing. So far, I have learned that there are many makeup brands that are cruelty-free, but they test overseas in China. We have drafted an email to makeup brands NARS and Kat Von D to inquire about testing on animals. At exhibition, we are going to put different makeup samples in similar containers and ask people to take swatches of each to see if they can tell a difference between products tested on animals and not tested on animals. If they cannot tell the difference, we are going to encourage them to switch to cruelty-free makeup. I love being able to work with a group and a mentor that helps us along the way. Through my exhibition and project, I hope to encourage people to use cruelty-free makeup. Hi, my name is Catherine, and I am in Mrs. Jacobs' fifth grade class at Central Park. My group is studying food and agriculture with an emphasis on agriculture. We are working to encourage people to grow their own food at home. We are interested in this because all the food recalls lately. In our research, we found that there were over 130 recalls in 2017 alone. The latest recall on romaine lettuce helped us decide on an action to take. At exhibition, we are going to give everyone lettuce plants to grow at home. To help us with our research, we invited Mrs. Rathbun to speak to our group. She works for the Department of Agriculture. My team is also going to help take care of the Memorial Presbyterian Garden. I really like that exhibi in, with exhibition, our teachers are giving us time every day to make a difference in the world. In my group, I have learned a lot about my classmates, and we are working together well. Throughout exhibition, I have learned that it doesn't have to be a big action to make a difference in the world. Thank you. With that, 
we will be extending an invitation to our exhibition, which is coming up on Thursday, June 7th, beginning at 6 o'clock. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to share our year of firsts and our celebrations with you. We have grown so much as a staff and as a school family. I am so proud of our accomplishments this year and look forward to seeing what the future has in store. Thank you. Thank you. coding group that would like to share really quickly could they bring their Chromebooks around to just show oh, yeah. you their that basic coding like, yes. or we would be happy to answer any questions very good let's start with questions too oh. do you Hi, not Michelle. really a question but just a compliment on on all of you students and that and the projects you talked about and your and you're so poised and and just relaxed and did such a nice job telling us what you did and um, I think you're starting on a big journey for education. I think some of you might be famous someday, so thank you for sharing. And I need somebody to teach me how to program. I know nothing about it. Excellent. There you have. I, I was impressed by all the uh, collaboration that everyone talked about and also how they um, had to you know, try again on different things, that things didn't work the first time, which is so important to learn that skill and not get frustrated by it and just look for a different way all the time. And I was impressed that a couple of you talked about that. Great job. At work, we talk about big projects and how to get things done in, the, in our community and in other communities. And um, what you were talking about tonight was uh, the same process that we use. We use plan, do, study, act. And you hit on every one of those in, in your PYP, IB, Project Lead the Way program. And um, it's, it's real life experience. It's, it's exciting to see. And it's exciting to hear straight from the kids um, their impact and, and the questions they come up with. And knowing they don't have to be, have the right answer right away, but that it's a journey, it's a process. And that's what learning is all about. So thank you for your dedication and all of this. I wanted to say thank you too for um, your strong uh, pledge of allegiance today. That was very nice. And I know when I volunteer at school, I hear the the pledge every day. And I know those kids are just speaking out. And that's that's really proud proud moment. <laughs> Is that coming over the mics? <laughs> that was good. That's pretty neat. I'm not afraid of you. I'm looking forward to the um, fifth grade exhibition, too. That will be really extraordinary. Looking forward to that. You know, Pam, I would just add, um, Jen, to slow it down, Jen spoke so quick, but what accomplishment. Open a new school in a brand new theme and brand new learning environment different than anything we've had they've been doing IB for about three years and now they've integrated project lead the way and you saw the power of that with exhibition PYP and what the themes they were talking about project lead the way and what kind of learners are these going to be when they hit middle school and high school and eventually out this is this is what we dreamed of guys and it's a great start thank you guys Very good. thank you, thank so you. Much. <laughs> That was the tigers coming up. Right. Great idea. That's funny the way you said you had to add water and bring that tiger up. Yeah, yeah, that's thinking outside the box. Oh, thinking outside the box. Those were second graders that talked to that. So that was great job. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks Very for coming nice. out. Good great job. job. Thank you. Job, Thank you, Jen. Jen. Hey, nice <laughs> job. <laughs>
Okay, now we will move into item 3.3. We have an item for action, one student reinstatement and one student expulsion. Mrs. Greg? Mm -hmm. A board subcommittee of three board members, um, the superintendent, myself, school administration, and parents met on the morning of May 11th in regards to student A who has applied for reinstatement to Midland Public Schools for the 18-19 school year. It is a recommendation of the board subcommittee at this time that student A not be reinstated. The recommendation is for further academic progress and additional counseling. Uh, this action requires a roll call from the board. Okay. I would entertain a motion. I'll so move. So you so move to not reinstate the student at this time. Do I have a second? Support. And, um, motion by Mary, support by Angela. Is there any discussion? We'll move into a roll call vote. Okay. Mr. McFarland? President Singer. Aye. Vice President Brandstadt. Aye. Treasurer Frizzi is absent. Member Baker. Aye. Member Blazy. Aye. Member Friedel. Aye. I also vote yes. Six yes votes to okay. support the motion. Thank you. Okay, student B. I'm a board subcommittee of three board members, the superintendent, myself, and school administrators met on the same morning, the 11th, in regards to student B, who's being recommended for expulsion. It is the committee's recommendation that student B serve the expulsion. Student B can reapply for reinstatement by December 1st, 2018. The student will be working with the PATHS program, and a tutor will be provided weekly. This action also requires a roll call vote. I will move to support the expulsion of student B. Support it. Moved by McFarland. I'm sorry, I will move. Moved by McFarland, support by Friedel. And uh, is there any discussion? Okay, we'll move into a roll call vote. President Singer. Aye. Vice President Branstad. Aye. Treasurer Frizzi is absent. Member Baker. Aye. Member Blazy. Aye. Member Friedel. Aye. I also vote yes. Six yes votes. Very good. Thank you. Moving into item 3.4 for action, we have the Midland County Educational Service Agency 2018-19 budget. Mr. Sherrill? As uh, been in our past practice, we um, we hear the motion from to either approve or not approve the ESA budget. It is more of a formality. Their board has full responsibility to approve their budget or not, but it's a privilege that we get to take a look at that. And the last um, two or three years, we've been invited over to review the budget, and we take our business officials and myself, and we go through the budget, and we are recommending approval. Um, they're they're budget keeps them in a good healthy financial position a little stronger in their special education fund than their general fund but both of them are still strong um, a slight uh, increase about one percent to their for raises to their employees and uh, we fully recommend approval of that budget at this time thank you I would entertain a motion I move to approve the ISD budget resolution in support of the Midland County Educational Services Agency 2018-2019 budget. A complete copy of the resolution shall be attached to the original of these minutes. Support. Oh. Okay, we have a moved by Mr. McFarland, support by Ms. Baker, and is there any comments? Um, I just want to say I was, it was nice to see it more itemized this year so we could actually see what we were approving instead of just a dollar amount, and that was nice. Very good. I agree. Uh, um, it seems like there's more uh, conversation and uh, about what, what was uh, being asked and what was on the budget and the exp expenditures and more of a uh, collaborative effort between the, the schools and the ESA. So that was uh, much appreciated. Process went, process went very well. Okay. If there's no more comments, we will uh, take a vote. Thank you. President Singer. Uh, oh, this has to be roll call. Uh, aye. Vice President Branstad. Aye. Member Baker. Aye. Member Blazy. Aye. Member Friedel. Aye. I also vote yes. Six yes votes. All right. Thanks for coming, John. <laughs> Item 3.5 for action. We have Siebert and Chestnut Hill uh, additional aluminum entrances and windows. Mr. Cooper. 
Yeah, as we discussed previously, we had uh, removed from the original bond work at Chestnut Hill and Siebert some selected aluminum entrances and windows. And we were working on time to uh, work for some cost savings by doing some off-peak installation savings, uh, meaning uh, after that summer construction season, you can see that we are able to get an additional $9,234, approximately 3.4, 3.5% of the cost, and we bring to you uh, the change order low bid architectural uh, glazing systems for $259,987. Very good. I will entertain a motion. I move for approval of the Seabird and Chestnut Hill additional aluminum entrances and windows. Support moved by Brandstadt, support by Friedel. And is there any discussion? Nice job on the savings. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. I know aluminum prices are going up, so it's great that we were able to uh, work this out and take advantage of downtime and uh, get them in the building. So thank you for the, the thinking out of the box and uh, saving us some money. We were notified another week or so the, the prices are going up. It appears to be a little bit of speculation because there's been a change a little bit, I think, on the tariffs. But um, the supplier notified they are going up 9%, 7%, somewhere in that range. And that will definitely have an impact on us moving forward. Yeah, so. maybe they'll go back down. I don't know. Who knows? Right. I have a couple comments. So, um, just as a little bit of history to this, back in November, the original bid came in over budget, and we, and we did uh, issue an addendum number six to value engineer items as well as removing some items from the projects. Um, the project still came in a little bit over budget, but it was approved and we move forward with it. Um, as has been reported, we have uh, considerable bond savings at the moment, and that was explained uh, by Daryl and has also been followed up uh, by Mr. Sherrill. Um, but the construction savings, that portion has been spent, but we have savings from technology and from our owner fund as well. So we still have the savings there, but not really on the construction. We still have considerable savings. But also, um, the budget transfer number five, that was also for the STEM elementary school. So you recall, as Mr. Shiro had stated, we have $5.2 in savings and over 600 in interest. So we have $600 or $6 million to cover any remaining current projects which we anticipate to be just under two million which I believe this applies to these windows and doors that we're discussing today is that correct are you asking <laughs> is it coming out of that savings correct okay yeah um, also recently there were items that were added to the web page which shows additional completed bond projects not originally in the bond of 6.67 .6 million which is absolutely phenomenal and to still also retain a good portion of that savings. Um, and then recently, though, we have in our Barton Mallow packet, in, in this packet for today's meeting, it lists an overall project contingency for the Series 1 bond issue at 521000 of the $71.8 million. And I was wondering if we could request that this report matches closer to what we have in our savings to show that in our full bond report because there's not that much money in contingency, but we all know we have the savings due to the technology savings of Chromebooks versus iPads and other things that have gone along with that. So I think our contingency should be shown as a little bit higher. But I don't know if we can incorporate that into the report or not. We can look, we can look at all of that, but I think um, contingency, it's splitting the word definition of contingency, I think. Yeah, I what? think the contingency that you usually see on there is for the projects that have been bid out and not uh, remaining part of the bond that hasn't been spent, but we can look at it. That, that's the first take, I think, if I understood what you asked, that, yeah. that that's maybe what you're seeing. The difference in it can be uh, the contingency of what's bid out, but but we can check on that. I think it's the definition of contingency, but we can take a look at that. So uh, bond savings and contingency on the previous projects aren't included in that number. It's contingency on the present ones, but without having it all in front of me, mm -hmm. I'd have to go back and take a look exactly at that, but it's, it's the definition of contingency. Okay. Um, along with the post-bid addendum number six, 
uh, Mr. Sharo explained that it was issued to reduce costs at Seabird and Chestnut Hill due to overpriced costs after we sent out the bids. All scope productions were redesigned, value engineered, or price negotiated with suppliers and still meet the intent of the full bond work. Um, both doors and windows are being rebid because of original bids were over costs. Um, but I wanted to point out today that you're asking for approval for the exact dollar amount that was deducted on addendum number six back from December 12th for the doors and windows. So we didn't actually rebid it, but we're revisiting with the same contractor for the amount that was deducted. We took the low bidder and went back and negotiated $9,000 in savings to allow him to do it when he's not as busy so he can, he can save the labor. And so, yes, we went back to the low bidder because that's the bid that was accepted. Technically, you, you could almost write it up as a change order. Uh, and then we negotiated $9,000 savings is what we did. Okay. Um, but there's also a technicality in that I understand it was the low bidder, but you also have to understand it was the only participating bidder in addendum number six, which was all negative numbers. So we really only had one bid in the category, just as a clarification. Well, I, I, we disagree with you on that. There, when we bid it out, there was multiple bidders. When we asked for changes to the lo their bids, trying to get more savings, one um, submitted changes. So bidding, there was multiple bidders. But for the final addendum six, there was only one participant of the four. Only one put in more changes. The other ones were still participating. Their bid was live. They did not put submit changes. Okay. Savings. All right. They had opportunity to. Oh, yes, I, I agree. But they chose not to participate for whatever reason. Correct. Um, I did have a concern about the date on the quote, which was 316, and this is the third board meeting since you've been in possession of the quote, and I know that you've been telling us all along and keeping us apprised that aluminum costs are rising. I just was curious why we're waiting this long to address it when we've had it for the March meeting and the April meeting, and now we're addressing it in the May meeting. I do know that prices are going up, and you had to uh, actually release the shop drawings, which I'm sure that I would suppose locked in the price so that we didn't incur that increase, but that's a big gap of time. Yep, and then we've significantly slowed our process down a little bit at your request because we've gone to FFO meetings two weeks prior to board meetings, board package a week prior to it. So it takes nearly a month to five to six weeks for us to take action on any of those any pieces. It's a slower moving process now. Okay. And that, that's the time strength we had into it. Could have probably done it a week or two, but this board meeting is scheduled in May, didn't hold a special board meeting, and we still make the time for the uh, beating the deadline of the increase from the supplier. Okay. Um, I also had one concern of, of the, in our board summary, our, our packet, our executive summary from Barton Mallow, the contingency for Chestnut Hill is only 161000 And if this request for funds I know is split between the two schools, so if you take the 260 and divide it in half, or there might be a little bit more on Siebert because of a couple more windows, that's going to reduce their contingency down to $30,000, and the project is just beginning so I didn't know if that was an element of concern if I for could that. Mike yeah uh, go ahead I think you, we, we're going to take it out of the bond savings and not the contingency yep. so that's not okay come, yeah. the contingency remains so the contingency right was yeah because I think you asked earlier we took we're taking this out of the bond savings outside of I guess that's best that I want to describe it um, what's been set aside for Chestnut Hill and, and Siebert so it won't affect the uh, uh, the contingency okay so I guess the, the question that I've always asked and always will continue to ask is, is this purchase of additional windows and doors within our budget? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. All right. We, we definitely think it's good use of savings. Um, we want to protect that savings knowing that 
since 2013 when this bond was drawn up, costs have increased and will probably continue to increase. So we want to be very slow using that present savings that we have because most likely with costs increasing, we're not going to see a whole lot of savings on future projects. So yes, this is going to be quite uh, finagling going forward to stay under budget, accomplish the work we want with cost increases. And hence, that's why you've seen us be pretty creative in using uh, capital improvement funds, our guys at time doing some of the smaller projects, those pieces going forward. But yeah, it's plenty within the budget right now. Um, and it was our intent to always, to, we, we prioritized the doors and the windows all along. That was a priority that we lost in, in addendum six that we wanted to do. So this is, you're seeing the first of it as we come. I think there's some flooring we'd like to, to add back um, on some of it. Um, and then um, we're feeling maybe, I think there was some sinks that we think our guys could pick yeah, up case, and do. Case work. Case work. There's case work being done, but there's some more case work that we've kind of identified that we would, would be maybe a possible priority. So over another year, year, year and a half, we'll be at those buildings. You know, we'll continue to try to uh, increase the amount of work we've done there in, in every creative way we can do that. So since this was removed from scope and then added back in a separate resolution, is this treated as a change order? And then if it is treated as a change order, are there any additional fees that we incur? None. So change orders is a very broad word. You know this, Brad. Um, mm -hmm. so many of the change orders are actually our request driven. Um, and so there are the contracts with our, our um, construction manager and architect is on the whole the dollar amount of the bond set at the very beginning. There is no way for them to increase their fees and they're going forward. <laughs> except for come in under budget when we're all done, accomplish all the work, and then have so much that we, we can go back out and do more work. So they're actually motivated to stay under budget because that's the only way they could ever make any more money than the original fee. Okay. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and if I could, it, change order, it was the size of this change order being so large, we thought that the board should, we should bring it to the board, bring it to FFO and make sure. Most change orders aren't. Yep. We could, we could have done a change order, but we, would, we right. didn't feel comfortable with it there. Okay, very good. Any other questions? We will move into a vote then. All in favor of approving item 3.5, say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Okay. Five ayes and one opposed. All right, at this time we will move into item 4, which is a request to address the board. I believe we have several folks that would like to address the board. So um, shall we start with uh, Dr. Vanette? Dr. Vanette, if you could state your name and address, and then we'll set the timer for five minutes. Uh, Jennifer Vanette, 603 Coolidge Drive. Thank you. First, I would like to thank the board for responding to my suggestions at the last meeting. I'm pleased that several of you have indicated agreement that we need to continue to improve on addressing diversity and inclusion in the schools. And I was also pleased to hear from Superintendent Sharo that he would be participating in a diversity training experience. These are all positive steps, so I thank you. I also told Mr. Sharo that I wouldn't stop advocating for the best outcomes and Ms. Branstad has said to come and talk directly to you, so here I am again. John Dewey once wrote, we're all instructors to realize that the quality of mental process, not the production of correct answers, is the measure of educative growth, something hardly less than a revolution in teaching would be worked. Our system of education has moved away from Dewey's vision on how to educate children as we have moved towards more testing and large class sizes with little ability for teachers to address students' individual needs and performance levels. Dewey would be kind of appalled. Education is not for the purpose of training workers. It is to cultivate a lifelong exploration of knowledge and a cultivation of curiosity. In the end, if done right, that will create a learned and thoughtful citizenry. I shouldn't have to be here to tell you that tonight, but you're about to approve spending of over 20,000 on third and fourth grade social studies in order to flip what's taught in each grade, mostly for the purpose of some questions on the English language arts portion of the MSTEP. Not the social studies MSTEP, 
the ELA portion. So I can only imagine the purpose might be a sort of gaming of the system by preparing them with social studies answers rather than allowing them to simply be tested on reading comprehension, but I really don't know. The hours allotted for this PD time only provide two hours for the classroom teachers, which hardly seems sufficient given that the teacher leaders are granted 25 hours. So there's an imbalance in how this development time has been organized. It feels wasteful. But it's especially wasteful to do this just to prep for an unrelated test question. Considering our books at Adams were published before 9-11, perhaps money could be better spent by updating materials. This might seem like an unrelated tangent, but I know that school safety is a major concern. We address safety, though, by building community and expressing the human value of each student. I believe it's not a small coincidence that school shootings have dramatically risen at the same time that high pressure standardized testing has increased, along with growing class sizes, higher homework burdens, less free play, recess, physical education time, more pay to play extracurriculars, and frankly, a national school system determined to drain the joy of learning from our schools. The students are not okay. They are adrift. Building relationships brings the school community together. A test should determine if students need more instruction rather than placing a point value on worthiness. We should not be teaching to a test under any circumstances. Teachers should have small enough class sizes so that they can get to know their students and work to build community. They should have the freedom to experiment with new methods of teaching in order to reach students where they are. I felt the cavalier attitude about the high testing burden expressed by the board last meeting was troubling to me. We might have to comply to receive funding, but we don't have to embrace a system designed to suppress learning, demotivate, and depress our students. If we care about school safety, we would reconsider our attitude about testing and not devote thousands of dollars to ace a couple of M-step questions. Where we place our money reflects our district's values. I ask you to more carefully consider the values we express by spending our resources on equipping teachers to teach rather than promoting a culture of testing above all else. <clears throat> Do we value the development of one's ability to express oneself, understand others, learn by doing, develop cooperation and responsibility? Students are actively taught rather than told to passively regurgitate answers our district will fare well enough on the test. I hope you agree it's time to realign our priorities and stop wasting precious resources on a test that in the end proves nothing. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Burnett. I didn't know Brian wanted to, to weigh in at this time or we should wait at the end. Um, we have three or four different folks that are going to come uh, talk to us tonight. So I thought the board could uh, make comments at the end, keep your notes and make comments at the end. But I didn't know uh, if you wanted to weigh in now or at the end. Uh, probably during the staff development proposal time, um, right when we get there, when I do the introduction, that would probably be the best. All right, perfect. All right, thank you. All right, I, I believe uh, Sarah Hecklick. Again, if you'd state your name and address. Yeah. Uh, Sarah Hecklick, uh, Auburn, Michigan, 1256. Um, good evening. My name is Sarah Hecklick, and I've been with the Midland Public Schools for 15 years. I'm speaking on behalf of the English departments at both Dow and Midland High. Our purpose is to go on public record with our collective displeasure at the administration's handling of the controversy surrounding the book, The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian by Sherman Alexie. First, we would like to thank the community members who have supported our work and have made public expressions of that support in the newspaper, at this board meeting, during parent-teacher conferences and on social media. We feel fortunate to serve as instructors in this involved and supportive community. First, we, um, second, as trained professionals, we are no strangers to the book controversies. We teach the English language arts, and as an arts instructor, we have long weathered issues with our texts. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, The House of the Spirits, To Kill a Mockingbird, and many other texts have sometimes pushed our students into unfamiliar realms. None of our books have been immune from parental concern. 
For years, we have followed an established procedure for approaching these pieces, and our students and classrooms have benefited. We have the respect, dignity, and grace to handle sensitive to topics in the classroom. Yet, the procedure that was forced upon us concerning the use of Alexi's text essentially means that none of us will teach this book. We are being required to designate the book as particularly sensitive when we feel that all of our texts are sensitive. We are not comfortable labeling the content in this book as worse than the racism and innuendo in other texts. Our main goal in appearing here tonight is to express our concern for the president that this decision sets for the use of all of our books and movies. Take Romeo and Juliet, for example. Should a parent object to that text, might we be required to teach this text under similar constraints? Will all texts now have to be taught as book clubs when teacher guidance is needed? In short, our opt-out independent study alternative was the accepted practice in the past and has served us well. As English language arts professionals, we feel deeply disheartened by the lack of respect for our experience and our training and the district's handling of this current book controversy. We emphatically deny any MPS communication that implies our agreement with this new approach. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hecklick. Uh, Sarah Dodig? Hello. Thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, my name is Sarah Dodic, and I'm a teacher at Midland High. And I have to state my address. Is that correct? Yes. OK. Uh, I live in Freeland, uh, and I teach in Midland. And um, I am here. Well, oh, address 10147 Willis Bend Court. It's a really long one. Um, <laughs> I am here today to ask you to revisit the new policy on our teaching of the absolute true diary of a part time Indian. I have taught this as a full class novel the last two years in my English classes, and both times it's, an, it's been an extremely powerful experience. Students have told me things like it's been their favorite book. <coughs> uh, many have finished ahead of schedule, which rarely happens. And the test scores for this book have been higher for the, than for those of other texts that I've taught. I commonly ask my students for their reactions when we finish a book. And I would like to read you two quotes that students have commented on this year. One student said, quote, this was a very strong and powerful text. I liked it because I could relate to some of the situations and feelings that Junior experienced, end quote. Many of my students can relate to poverty, discrimination, grief, loss, and a sense of hopelessness. They need stories of people who have experienced this and overcome. They need this story, and that's why I'm here today. Another student said, quote, I really liked the book. It brought up topics that can be uncomfortable to talk about. It really opened my eyes to what's happening around me. It brought many life lessons. Many of our students have learned a great deal from reading and studying this book. They get that it's not just a story. And I love that certain topics were uncomfortable to talk about, as I believe that some of the best literature we can expose our students th to is that which makes them feel uncomfortable. Native Americans face horrible hardships in our society. We should be concerned about this. We should read about it, and we should discuss it in our classrooms. The new policy states that students must opt in and that it must be taught in a book club format. I am concerned and confused by this new procedure as we've always had an opt-out method when students or parents wanted an alternate text in any subject matter in any of our classes. We are treating this text differently than all other texts in our curriculum. Furthermore, throughout this challenge, the concern has been the mature subject matter of, and content of the book. Confining the teaching of this book to a book club format does not allow teachers to have important whole class discussions and guide students through the sensitive nature of the book. In a book club format, I can be involved in these discussions, but in a much more limited way. I have had a class in which all of my students have opted to read the book, and I would like us to have the option to read it as a full class novel in this situation. Another scenario that we need to consider is the use of this book in our special education classrooms. 
These classes tend to be smaller, which makes the book club format more problematic. Many of our students require texts to be read aloud per their accommodations, or they need more teacher-led guidance and instruction. In conclusion, I am asking the board to revisit this issue. We have used texts with mature subject matter and language for many years, from Shakespeare to Steinbeck and the list goes on. I am proud of the fact that we offer our students a variety of great literature and we have always allowed students to read alternate texts, complete independent studies, whatever makes the students and parents feel most comfortable. The policy for this book should be no different. As teachers, we will always respect parents' decisions on what books are appropriate for their children to read. However, that choice should never infringe on other students' access or experience with that literature. Please revisit this policy. Reread the book. Watch some interviews with Sherman Alexi in which he discusses his work and consider the full impact of this policy. Alexi wrote about his own experiences as a Native American boy growing up on a reservation. And I think it's important that we offer this perspective to our students. I want my students to have as many opportunities as possible to be challenged, read great literature, and I really think having this book, book as part of our curriculum helps us make that possible. And I thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Stodick. Um, do we have anyone else that would like to Ring. speak? There, there was another name uh, Ring, here, Jennifer. Ringwald, Jennifer Ringwald. Okay. It's okay. I don't mind going to I'm Jennifer Ringwald, 2801 Highbrook Drive. I'm here again to speak with you regarding preschool through Midland Public Schools. I am still extremely concerned about the district's commitment to running two completely separate preschool programs. As a Chestnut Hill parent and PTO member, I participate on the MPS District School Improvement Committee. It was at the initial DSIC meeting this year where I learned of the MPS Early Childhood Services expansion, including our two four-year-old preschool programs, Great Start Readiness and tuition-based IBPYP, that will run separately, yet side-by-side, -side, in the newly remodeled Carpenter Street building in 2018-19. My own personal experience with Great Start Readiness is what has brought me in front of you now for the second time. I was born and raised here in Midland, graduated from Dow High, moved away for a time, and returned when our sons were two and eight months old. As a stay-at-home mom, I diligently researched preschool for my son to be three-year-old. He was able to attend a local private program. A few years later, when our second son was getting ready for preschool as a four-year-old, our family circumstances had changed. Financially, at that time, we couldn't afford him the same private program as his older brother. We were fortunate to know someone who helped us find Great Start Readiness programming when it was housed at the ESA Sugnet building. We qualified and he had an amazing year. Fantastic teachers, met wonderful friends, and was more than academically prepared for his Young Five program the following year. Hearing about these two separate programs running side by side impacted me, maybe more so than most, because of my experience with not having the ability to choose a privately funded preschool program for one of my children. To have walked into our preschool building each day knowing a privately funded preschool class was running there simultaneously that wasn't available to our child because we couldn't afford it would have been very upsetting. I would have noticed then and I won't stay silent now. The two separate socioeconomically segregated classes that this administration plans to run next year at Carpenter Street School puts Midland Public Schools families in a situation that says they're not equal. The emotional response that I just described for you is only reinforced by the different curriculum and program requirements for the separate GSRP and IBPYP classes. In our K-12 schools, 
when a student qualifies for a free and reduced lunch, we do everything in our power to make sure that little to no opportunity is available to differentiate students based on the cost of their lunch. At the end of each meal, free or not, the meal is supposed to be the same. In this current preschool programming, Midland Public Schools is actively differentiating students by the cost of preschool, separating them from each other, and not providing the same curriculum. All four-year-old students in Midland Public Schools do not end up each day, each week, or at the end of an academic year with the same opportunities. How is this possible that this board and this administration has allowed for Midland Public School preschool to develop to this point? Outcomes of these decisions, both direct and unintended, must be addressed. addressed sorry. My ask is still the same as one month ago, that you as a board commit time, energy, resources, and do everything in your power to eliminate this promotion of socioeconomic segregation and feelings of division and superiority among our youngest students and their families. It's time for problem solving and to try a new um, design for a program in which all four-year-old students taught by this district receive the same education together. Please show the community that this board supports public preschool because each child matters. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ringwald. Do we have anyone else who would like to speak to the board tonight? I'm All right. If you'd state your name and address, and we'll set the timer for five minutes. Kurt Yaki, 3600 Valley Drive. Um, I, I'd like to start by uh, um, applauding each one of the folks that have spoken tonight that have challenged the governance of the school district because. Uh, and it seems to me that how can these things be the least bit controversial? And what I'm about to talk about is the same thing. Let, let me start with a brief history. Um, the public was addressed in 60 meetings and then a 45 minute, I think, video about the upgrades that were gonna be uh, provided as a result of the tax increase that was voted in in 2015. Within months of that, uh, preparations were made to replace items that had been promised and, uh, for these neighborhood schools. Before the cuts to those uh, promised items were acted upon by the board, the administration provided no notice to the public that they, for what they had voted, uh, may not be provided. I was mistaken when I came here last time and I said I thought there were 60 uh, items deleted and I've been corrected. There were 105. Uh, the cuts that were made, I would say, secretly and without any notice to the public or any notice to the news media or even through the communiques that Mr. Sharrow writes what, every week, since the public didn't hear about any of those, it, it, there was a website that was uh, constructed and uh, the question was why was money being harvested from the neighborhood schools and where was it going? The name of the website was brokenpromises-midlandschools.com. Since the website was published there have been over 6,000 visits to the website so it seems to me that there may be some interest in the topics raised therein. Multiple correspondence has been sent uh, to Mr. Sharrow's office asking questions about how public money appears to have been redirected from where it was promised and there have been no responses provided. So the questions that are unanswered by the board and the administration are perhaps easily answered, perhaps not, we don't know. Why was anything cut if there are excess funds? Why is the general fund being used? Why is it being weakened when there should be plenty of money from the bond savings that we were 
told exist in the amount of $5 million or something like that. And why are we using sinking fund funds if a surplus exists? So, and to me, a very important issue is why didn't the administration tell the public in 2015 that their vote for the tax increase would only be a vote for a wish list as was described by our superintendent at the last board meeting? So, which is true? Was money harvested from the neighborhood schools? Has it already been spent? Is there really a reservoir of, I don't know how much money, because it keeps changing, I think. Um, so I have this suggestion. If it really isn't controversial for the public to ask questions about where did the money go and why were things like deletions part of uh, what has gone on. And since there were, I may have the number wrong, but there were 60 meetings that, that went on in the community to try to um, suggest to the population that they should vote for this uh, tax increase. Why not have an informational meeting now? where the public can ask all their questions, how the public money has been spent. And I would suggest that we do this soon. Because if this is all a great big misunderstanding, it's time to know it now. So my suggestion is, within the next week or two, that we either find out there's something to be discussed or there isn't. And if I'd be happy to help set that up if there's any need to help set up the date and time for such a public meeting about public money. Thank you, Mr. Yaki. Thank you. Okay, we are, we have one more person who would like to address Thank the board. You. My name is Becky King. Uh, I live at 405 Lingo Lane, and I'm a teacher at Midland High. I've been a teacher at Midland High for 18 years, and it's been a great opportunity for professional growth. I've never taught anywhere else, and I can't imagine teaching anywhere else. And even as a new teacher, I felt supported and valued by my building administration, who helped guide and shape me as a professional, and I'm very grateful for that. However, this year during year 18, as Sarah and Sarah have mentioned, I and my colleagues in the English departments at Midland High and Dow High feel that that professionalism has been questioned and compromised by the handling of the text, The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian. For 17 years, I have handled parental concerns about our literature selections on a case-by-case -case basis with respect for family belief systems and individual students. Whether it's the N-word in Huck Finn or To Kill a Mockingbird or other sensitive topics in our world literature texts, I worked with teachers, parents, and administrators to the success of my students. And I know my colleagues have done the same. Yet for some reason, that professionalism is not enough. It no longer seems trusted for one specific book that's very engaging for readers. We are no longer allowed to address the sensitive topics in the LA classroom like racism, profanity, substance abuse, and domestic violence. The latest dictate we received regarding this text say that we cannot teach the award-winning book as a whole class. It must be used in a book club fashion with students reading in small groups. I think that's more dangerous than banning the book outright. The district agrees that the book contains sensitive material, yet wants students to try to navigate through a maze of difficulty without any guidance. I think that does our students a, dis a great disservice, especially those who actually deal with racism, profanity, substance abuse, and domestic violence in real life. It also undermines the professionalism of our teachers. We guide our students through tough times each and every day. 
we have the respect, dignity, and grace to handle these topics in the classroom. And we selected this text because of the value it provides. And we assumed that our professional judgment would be valued as well. As Sarah said, our students need to see these stories. We are not satisfied with the resolution that was agreed upon after a few parental complaints. I respectfully ask that we reconsider the treatment of this text. I and my colleagues are willing to work through this process, but we are concerned with the slippery slope that it creates in regard to all of our texts and curriculum. But personally, it saddens me that our professional judgment seems to have been disregarded. I know that's not how you want your teachers to feel. I know this is just one book, but we can do better. We can do better than what has happened this year. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Thank King. You. Would anyone else like to uh, address the board tonight? Okay, seeing none, we will move into item five, which is curriculum instruction and assessment. I believe we have uh, committee minutes. Uh, Ms. Me Friedel? Yep. Um, this, uh, these meeting minutes are from Monday, April 16th. Um, curriculum office administrators shared information with the committee on the staff, staff development process and staff de development proposals that were submitted for consideration. The 19 proposals submitted addressed a diverse array of content areas. Several proposals focused on innovative programs and initiatives targeted at closing the achievement gap. The concerted effort was made with in the proposals to shift work out of the school day and into the summer or after school hours. These proposals are uh, introduced in the April board meeting for public examination and to the May Board of Education meeting for action. Implementation will be based on available funds for the 2018-19 budget. Uh, we met again today uh, and went to the um, uh, career tech buildings uh, that, that's currently being built a home. Um, was a wonderful opportunity to see our career tech um, building students um, and the wonderful work they're doing. So that's what I have. Our next meeting uh, is next uh, September. Very good. Thank you, Mary. I believe we're going into item 5.2, which is staff development proposals for action. Um, would you like to have a little background on that? Yeah, sure. Uh, without trying to be redundant in what Mary said, everything was on the minutes from the last meeting. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the third and, excuse me. Thank you. Uh, much better. Talk a little bit about the staff development proposal for the third and fourth grade social studies. Um, for some brief clarification on that, what we are attempting to do with that is to bring to the forefront updated materials uh, that do align with the state standards. So the state standards really for us here in MPS, we've had reversed in third and fourth grade what we've been doing for a while. We do acknowledge that our materials do need an update and our updates are intended to venture us into the world of what we call OERs or online educational resources. Those are very new to many of our staff members and so the money that we're trying to devote is to bring that resource to our staff and to allow them to have time to truly vet and be trained on how to use an online educational resource that would align to us becoming um, back into compliance with where the state standards are. And we really want to avoid overwhelming our staff members with so many changes all at one time. Next year we know at the elementary level that we have Project Lead the Way coming to the rest of our five elementary schools. Uh, we're also piloting over at Central Park uh, additional science kits through Serial City and we are very careful not to try and do 
too many initiatives at one time. So when we were considering making this move, we actually surveyed our elementary staff to see what their favorability was to this. 83% uh, of the staff surveyed were in favor of making the change now. We believe that's because they are rewriting their units to align with Project Lead the Way, and so they wanted to do this at one time rather than having rewrites happen to have on multiple occasions. Uh, we had unanimous support from our teacher leaders and we had unanimous support from our elementary principals as well too. So in the end we feel that this investment is actually going to be a step in a direction that will end up saving the district resources in the end by getting us into this world of online educational resources that are uh, up to date um, in a much more timely fashion than we can if we adopt physical texts um, on a cycle that uh, isn't quick enough to respond to changing history, changing topics, and changing times. So that's a little bit of clarification there. Um, then as Mary iterated, uh, the other 18 proposals focus on a myriad of activities, most of them aligned to innovation and to closing achievement gap initiatives. Many of them are building level initiatives as well too. Our continued support of the Midland High Math Initiative, uh, also the Dow High and the Midland High English Initiatives that have come to the forefront as well too. Uh, if approved this evening, then these will only be carried forward if the funds are available in the budget that you'll hear about in the coming months. Great, thanks. Yep. One question, um, just to, for clarification um, for the group here, is can you briefly explain the proposal process so folks in the room and on TV kind of understand uh, the process this goes through before we get to the point where we take action here? Sure. Uh, proposals originate in a couple of different ways. Um, they can be originated by staff members. Um, we've had them originate from principals. We've had them originate from teacher leaders. It can also originate from the curriculum office as well, too. Um, the origin will then flow into the curriculum office where our uh, level coordinators will author those proposals. From that uh, point, they then get shared out and people can provide feedback on those. And uh, as I said, we seek the approval of principals, teacher leaders, and staff as well too. And people can sign on to those proposals and say that they have their support. From there, uh, we have an internal vetting committee that will help us prioritize and will also help <coughs> us reshape things before we bring them to our CIA subcommittee. At our CIA subcommittee, we spent almost two hours going through these. We bring all of the curriculum coordinators in so they can talk with our subcommittee in depth. And at that point in time, we take feedback from our subcommittee. And uh, sometimes we will not bring things forward to the full board based on that feedback. Sometimes we'll modify things as well too. From that phase, it then comes to the board for information, which happened last month. We had the review period, and that period is where public can read, solicit, and board members can as well too, and we listen to that feedback. And then we uh, bring it to the following board meeting, which is tonight, for official approval on those. So it's a multi-month <coughs> process, and the hours that go into these are numerous um, from all aspects of stakeholders that are involved. Great, great. All right, and this is for action tonight? Yes, ma'am. So I would uh, be ready to accept a motion for item 5.2. So move to uh, the staff development proposals. Support. Moved by Ms. Friedel, support by Ms. Baker. Uh, is there any discussion? I would have to say that I, I don't believe that any of the proposals were to uh, a fact that we're embracing testing or, or choosing to put kids through more testing or getting them ready for the test. I don't think that's the, uh, uh, the choice that we're making. We are preparing our students to meet state standards, which is supposed to be the all around best fit for all kids whether they're going to college or whether they're going on into the military or they're going on into uh, some trade and um, to give kids a well-rounded education. And um, a lot of the proposals are come from a lot of teachers' input and, and their desire. And um, I agree that the third and fourth grade social studies needs update that the book was outdated and that's um, the best way of handling it is to go with the online uh, educational curriculum that allows um, teachers to keep 
changing as things change so quickly in our world. So, Very good. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate that, too, the fact that we're looking at it, okay, the, uh, you know, the books are outdated. We know that we're not in a line with the state standards. Let's do it both at the same time. So I appreciate the thought process that went into that, because I, I do believe that it flipped back in between my children being in fourth grade. So it has been quite a while that they were actually flipped. And then when we, uh, when we align with state, the state, it also helps our students who are transient and might move in and out of the district, and that way they wouldn't repeat what they learned in possibly third or fourth grade uh, in a new school that they might attend. So uh, I think that's an important consideration as well. Did you have something, Scott? No. Any other comments? All right, we'll move into a vote then. Uh, all in favor of approving uh, the staff development proposals, item 5.2, say aye. 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 All opposed? It passes unanimously. We will move into item 6, which is finance facilities. We have minutes, and um, Ms. Baker will read the minutes. Yes, we met on May 7th, and um, the first discussion was on the bond update. Mr. Dombrow updated the committee on current work being done around the district. Tentative future timelines for remaining projects in Series 1 and beginning projects in Series 2 were presented. And then at finance facilities and operations, Mr. Cooper, Ms. Holderby, and Mr. Sharrow reviewed and discussed the following items with the committee. The March financials, which included the payment of the 3% retirement health refund from the state to employees, the MCESA 2018-19 budget was discussed and a resolution in support will be, was brought to the full board tonight. Siebert and Chestnut Hill additional aluminum entrances and windows. Savings of off-peak installation and upcoming aluminum price increases were discussed. A change order for the $259,987 to the low bidder architectural glazing systems will be acted on tonight at the board meeting. This value represents the low bid value of $269,000 $269,221 minus $9,234 for off-peak installation savings. And the next meeting will be Monday, June 4th. Thank you, Lynn. Um, when we were in that meeting, I thought the educators would be pretty excited about that 3% back. I bet uh, that brought some smiles. Uh, and that came from our state. And... Um, I was real pleased tonight, too, to, uh, to pass or to, to give our approval of the ESA budget that, um, that both groups worked, worked hard at. Uh, as far as the Seabert and Chestnut Hill, I'm thinking about the end of the school year, and I, I believe we're going to give the teachers an extra day to um, move their items out of the classroom, and we talked about that at, at that meeting as well. Two gifts. Yeah. Okay. We're moving to item 6.2 for information. We have gifts totaling $43,753.19. Mr. Cooper? Yes. It's uh, got to be a record for the numbers. So I, I was going to ask you if it was a record for uh, the line items. <laughs> Singer, you already gave us the total there. There are, For information, there's 6.2. There are 44 gifts. I think there's 50 on the list today. What better time but to remind everybody at the end of this on the TV screen, we do roll everybody's name and what they gave. They're all equally important, and I would hate to bring any single one to your attention here and, and miss all the other ones there. I think it, uh, if you just check the list, it's across the board and for lots and lots of different things. So it's, it's pretty impressive. Um, item 6.3, though, does require action just because of the amount of the single items. There's two items there. Uh, they total $16,221.04, uh, um, and that would require a vote on your part. Before you do that, may I also bring to your attention 6.4, which is informational. Just a lot of sequence here, but those are actual, um, doesn't require any action on your part, but they're actually gifts of those items. And so, as you can see there, 
everything from office supplies, yoga mats, and uh, viola. So that's there. But you do need to act on 6-3, which are those uh, two gifts that you see there for 16. No, oh, these are the most fun to act on. I'd entertain a motion for item six, or for uh, agenda item 6.3. I move we accept the gifts totaling $16,221 and four cents. Support. Moved by Brandstadt, support by McFarland. Any comments or uh, discussion? Really appreciate all the people that have contributed. The one for the um, BPA at Midland High. I know my daughter, her two best friends actually were on that trip and wonderful, wonderful educational experience for them. Absolutely. Uh, the generosity is overwhelming and appreciated, absolutely. So we'll move into a vote. All in favor of accepting the gifts for item 6.3, say aye. 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 All opposed? It's unanimous. <coughs> and then we'll move into human right resources, item 7.1. We have committee minute, meeting minutes from Mr. McFarland. Yes, we met on Friday, May 11th at 1030 in the morning. Uh, we discussed a number of things. One was a substitute teacher request. We had a PESG substitute teacher request a meeting with the board of the education subcommittee. We discussed a legal update uh, where we were informed that a legal suit against the district had been dismissed. Um, as far as negotiations go, we began negotiations with the Midland Federation of Paraprofessionals. The district and the MFP will meet again on February 7th, 2018. Um, we also approved a medical leave of absence in accordance with the MCEA master agreement. Uh, a little more negotiations. Ms. Marchese updated the committee on a tentative agreement reached with the Midland Federation of Paraprofessionals. Our next meeting date uh, is to be determined. That's all I have. Great. Okay, next. Um, the board and staff extend their deepest sympathies to the families of Mr. Gerald Hath, who passed away April 10th, 2018. Mr. Hath taught 7th and 8th grade science at Northeast for 31 years, retiring in 1981. In addition, he was the head tennis coach and the audiovisual coordinator for the building. Also extend our sympathy to Ms. Joan Falkerson, who passed away April 23, 2013. Ms. Falkerson spent 20 years with Midland Public School, the last 19 as the lead secretary at Midland High School. The following staff members announce their retirement effective as of these dates. Michael Barron, Skilled Trades, May 31, 2018. Sally Matula, paraprofessional, Chestnut Hill, June 14, 2018. Uh, Midland City Educational Association President, contract lease under the terms of this current contract between the Board of Education and Midland Public Schools and the, Midi excuse me, the Midland City Educational Association. A point six contract lease has been granted to Mr. Mark Hackbarth, who is actually the president of the MCEA for the 2018-19 school year. Very good, thank you. Moving into item eight, which is correspondence to and from the Board of Education. We have 8.1 for information, letters to the, uh, from the Board of Education, and those can be found in the agenda. Item 8.2 is FOIA requests, one from Mackinac Center and two from Kurt Yaki. Then we have item nine, which is scheduled activities for information. Uh, all of our um, meetings you can find on the Midland Public Schools website and uh, the agenda. Item 10, is we move into study discussion sessions. And at the end of, um, at the end of this, we'll move into closed session then for the Parapro. Yeah, we can talk about when we get there why and what we're doing. Right, right. Okay, so this, uh, Mary, I'd like to start with you for uh, study discussion. Um, I want to say I'm looking forward to graduation at Dow Diamond this Thursday, both high schools graduating uh, one after the other. And um, I also wanted to thank the district. I had the opportunity to uh, attend a communication and marketing conference that was presented through uh, Michigan Association of School Boards. I attended the session on school safety, crisis communication, combating fake news, and understanding communications. Um, very timely subject matter and um, really valuable, valuable content. Um, I would encourage all my fellow board members um, to take part in these opportunities when they're available. That it's um, 
only strengthens our membership and working for the district. Um, I was um, also had an opportunity last week to meet with the architects um, on the planning for the high school science labs, um, which I don't know how many years as a science teacher I kept coming, you know, oh, we're going to, it's going to happen. No, it's not going to happen. It's going to happen. No, it's not going to happen. So it went through this planning so many times, and I, I'm just so excited that it's actually going to happen. Um, so that was, that was really, really special. Um, I also wanted to address the um, Great Starts Readiness preschool program. Um, my grandson had an opportunity to uh, uh, attend that as well. And um, I don't think it's about a disparity uh, between the have and the have nots. I think it's a wonderful opportunity to pre uh, prepare students that wouldn't have had an opportunity. And um, my, my grandson actually looked forward to having an extra day off where he didn't have to go four days a week. Um, so um, it's a wonderful program. It has its strengths, as does the, the program that Midland Public Schools offers as a tuition-based. Um, I know my grandson's been well prepared through that program, and they can both function out of the same building. That's just my thoughts on that. Thank you, Mary. Brad? Oh, I just wanted to thank Central Park, Jen Servos, and all the explorers. Um, Dr. Vonette, Sarah Hetchlick, Sarah Dodick, Jennifer Ringgold, Kurt Yaki, and Becky King for coming up and, and uh, giving your opinions and thoughts. Uh, it's, it's always uh, good to hear from the public. Um, last week we touched on a topic that uh, we've talked about a couple different times that since the beginning of my term, uh, I've been concerned that we're reaching out further and further to get contractors to participate on our work. And started out as Tri-City, Tri-County, Great Lakes Bay Region, Central Michigan. Then we have this bigger radius that's on a map that south of Flint, north of West Branch. It's a big number, it's a big area, and it's big miles, but that's not the point. The point is the public has, has seen that. They've made comments to me that say, Okay, it isn't local, so what are you going to do about it? Also, I said in the last meeting that I'm going to look into that, see what I can do to try to help improve. Um, this isn't a favorable, favorable thing for middle and public schools because typically the lowest cost provider in construction is more of a local provider. I'm in contracting. I don't do all my work in Traverse City or in Detroit or in Grand Rapids because I'm not as competitive with respect to travel costs and other things related. So we wanted to look into that. I said that I would be committed to doing that. And I've met with some contractors and also um, Scott uh, was very concerned about that as well. He came up to me after the meeting, said, I want to be part of those meetings. So Scott went with me. Um, we only had a chance to touch a couple. Um, then it was... Um, Good meetings with them. Um, we came away with a couple items that I think that we can work on, and I think some of them are pretty simple. Um, there was a lack of confidence on, on how some of the bids were awarded because of whether it was based on the base bid, the cumulate, cumulative low, the single low, whether the addendums were a part of, they were a part of the package, but whether they were excluded as included with the base bid and or with some of the voluntary alternates that might have been accepted that could have changed the specifications to make it a little bit more maybe not so quite apples to apples based on the spec but there were dollar values to uh, back those things up um, one thing that came of concern and actually it was a brief mention in our meeting but i also have as a contractor, I'm in the same room with a lot of these guys on a regular basis of other contractors in the area, and there was some concern about us not paying on time. So um, I know we're having, it's a middle public school contract, they're signing a 45 to 60 day contract, and there was some uh, hurt feelings out there that it's not, the payment isn't coming until 90 days. 
So it's, it's not, con we don't contract so with a general contractor. It's a Barton Mel contract. We okay. pay Barton Mel. Our contract is with Barton Mel. Okay. So I would like to reach out to Daryl and his team to see if there's something that we can do because they feel um, a little bit hurt in that, that they're, they're, they're bearing the burden of the finance. And I told them I'd be happy to look into that. Um, and that's about the extent of it. I told them I'd be happy to look into it, that they feel that it, it's taken a little bit too long. So we'd be happy to look into that. I'm sure Daryl can talk to Mike and we can see if there's any type of issue or anything that we can do to speed it up. Thank you, Brad. Um, the only other item that I had was um, I had concern about uh, one of the categories last month and, and Scott, I give him credit, He's, he put me on the spot and said, okay, what category, Brad, do you have an issue with about you know, low bidding, and I said a roofing example. And Daryl replied back to us a couple of days later, including everybody in the board, to say that no, we've we've always taken the low bidder for roofing. And the reason I mentioned that, is I didn't get into exacts because it was in the past. And moving forward, we're working very hard to do that, but and sometimes it is my opinion that we haven't done that. That goes back to early 2017 where we bid out uh, a whole bid package and there were probably 10 categories and one category we decided to split but the other categories we chose not to to do them as cumulative so as part of one of those that we chose to do cumulative we could have saved some money if we would have split that category so that was my clarification for that so Saying that we always award to the lowest contractor is a little bit of semantics in that if you put them cumulatively together, that could be lower than the other, the other guy with his cumulative prices. But if you split one, you're exposing yourself to something where we should split them all. So I was not incorrect by saying that. I appreciate Daryl doing the follow-up, but I wanted to be heard by the board that there is a specific example and it was real and I think that we have improved moving forward whether we're splitting or cumulative or value engineering or addendums I think we have improved on that and I appreciate that okay do you have anything else no ma'am all right Scott um, thank you to all of our guests tonight um, who came out and spent their time and, and gave us their opinions and it really honestly gave us a lot to think about uh, moving forward on how we analyze topics and how we, I guess as a board, um, discuss and, and vote and, and move for what we believe is best for the students because that's, at the end of our day, the only thing we're here for. That's right. Um, so, so that is really nice to get feedback and, and, and I see some of you are still here. So I appreciate you guys being here and even sticking around to the end. I mean, you could have <laughs> said your piece and left, so that's awesome. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, we, we do appreciate it. And me personally, I can't speak for everybody else, but it is something I will continue to think about. And uh, as things progress, we, you know, we'll take it step by step. Um, hopefully we come to a solution where everybody's happy. Um, as far as the <clears throat> contracting, the, the payment, I didn't get the impression they were overly concerned with being paid late, they kind of attributed that to shuffling paperwork and, and whatever between secretaries. Um, you know, I kind of thought that was overemphasized. And then the other contractor we met with didn't have any issues at all other than uh, there were some issues with the, was it the NLRB or something with? It was a uh, concern about a classification that wouldn't be yeah, really acceptable, so, but that was a very so what I took from that is, is is them not being able to bid was just they just they couldn't compete with the um, pay rates that would have had been uh, done through the bond work. Yep, exactly. And and we're finding that with with a lot of small um, contractors, they just and that's nothing that we can control. Unfortunately, we're we're trying we're we're trying to get rid of of that, but. Um, at this point, we're, we're stuck with it, so, uh, you know, it's kind of maybe an unnecessary stigma on us that we're driving away local contractors when really we're not. They just can't adjust their payroll to, to go with the, with the bond work. Um, so that's, you know, something for, for the public to consider. And Mike, you can certainly elaborate on that. Yep. Um, but beyond that, looking forward to graduation. 
especially at Dow Diamond. That's yeah. going to be fantastic. It's the first time ever. Um, cross our fingers for the weather to hold out. Bring you sunshine. Yeah, and with that, uh, Angela. All off. right, thanks. So, yeah, I won't speak much about all the bond stuff because we have all said a lot, but I do want to say I, I hate the semantics of what's local and what's not local. I mean, we all know I, I work in Saginaw. I work with people. If you were to draw a radius, huge, you know, and we're all local. So, you know, we go south of Flint, we go almost to Lansing, we go out in the Thumb, we go up north, you know, that to me is local. So, you know, but maybe it's because I work for a global company and I spend a lot of my nights um, on the phone with people in China and a lot of my mornings on the phone with people in Poland and Morocco and Brazil. So to me, local is um, the semantics of if it's the city of Midland or if it's 40 miles, you know, radius around here or even 50 miles, that to me is nothing. So anyway, all right, on to the book. Just my only comment about that is that um, just to remind people, we did all have the opportunity to read that. So when you speak to that, we have we have read the book too. So know that we do when you're talking about it. We have that um, perspective of having read the book also. Um, let's see. This weekend, my husband and I went and um, viewed the house that the Building Trades um, built. That was very, very impressive. And we even got to meet the new homeowner. Oh. Um, who actually got to choose a lot of the interior finishes. But we were both very, very impressed with the um, program and the house that they built. It was a great house. Um, let's see. Um, everything else is near and dear to me um, in the next week because I have a graduate. And so, first of all, congrats to all the grads. They finish school on Friday, which they are all thrilled about. Um, really looking forward to graduation at Dow Diamond. Had a couple conversations over the weekend about it. One was a, um, we'll call him a new parent, someone who hasn't been through graduation in um, the gym yet. They had some concern about Dow Diamond. By the time I finished explaining to them the gym graduation, they are praying there is no rain Thursday. Mm -hmm. um, another person I talked to is so thrilled because the gym experience um, was going to um, foreclude the grandparents from coming because of the seating, and now the grandparents can attend, and that just um, really makes me thankful that we can provide that. Um, I know that you know there could be some glitches on Thursday because it's the first time, but um, it's still the right direction that we're moving. Um, I had the opportunity today to go back to Adams Elementary School with all the uh, graduating seniors who went to Adams there. And a wonderful experience. They let them uh, walk the halls in their caps and gowns. They all wear name tags in case the teachers didn't recognize them now that they're all 17 and 18 years old. And it was interesting that, it, of course, got posted all over Facebook today. And a um, former Adams parent, a family that has moved out of the area, actually posted on there um, how special it was and that if you didn't live in Midland, you may not understand how special that was. And that was in reference to the fact that Adams splits between the two um, middle schools and the two high schools. And to see all those kids come back together today and taking pictures together um, was just a wonderful experience. And then the last thing, I want to send out a huge uh, thank you to the counseling staff at Dow High um, this whole year again. They, every single week, send us an email on Fridays to walk all of us senior parents through the entire senior year process. And we really, really appreciate the hand-holding that we receive every single week. And um, I thank them from the bottom of my heart for the great job that they do. And that's it. Ooh, lots of good stuff. Well, I want to start with... Um, Congratulations, congratulating our Gerstacker winners. I was out of town in Colorado with my daughter, and it was the first one I'd missed. And um, so I'd like, to, I'd like to congratulate Pam and Sean and Robin and Lori um, for that great recognition. And I know I'm, one of my daughters had Robin, so I know her personally and well-deserved. Well 
uh, and also the teachers with the years of service and then the retirees. I know so many of those retirees. In fact, six of them are coming from Chestnut Hill. I said, boy, am I feeling my age because there's only going to be a couple people left that, that I know anymore. But well-deserved. They've put in many, many years and have touched many, many students and families. Um, and to our shining stars, Wendy, Ron, and Eric, as I always say, they do great great things behind the scenes that many, many of us don't recognize. Um, thank you to our speakers tonight. I would like to comment, though, that um, we always appreciate hearing from you and your input, but I'd like you to know, too, that we don't make any of these decisions lightly. We spend many hours in our, our subcommittees and with recommendations, and there's been research and information given to us by by staff or by our administrators or a combination of thereof. So um, decisions are never made lightly. There is a lot of background. We don't always, always agree, but please know that um, a lot of discussion and thought goes into it. And, and then on top of that, thank you to Central Park Elementary, your staff and the students. Just every time we have these presentations, I marvel at this generation of students who are so poised and what kind of education they're getting. I had five children graduate from MPS. They had great educations. They're all successful adults. But I have to say what I see in our schools now at the elementary level um, is just amazing. The thought process and the presentation and what these students are learning. And they're in, thank you to the staff. It is a huge learning curve for all of them. And you just see them, even tonight, the enthusiasm when you go into these buildings. They are excited about, about teaching and the hands-on and the robotics and the STEM and, and just the curriculum that we offer to our students. And along that line, building trades, thank you, Kevin, and your students. What a, an incredible home you've built once again this year. Um, we went over on Saturday as well. And... Um, I just marvel every time. And the owner and his daughter were walking up, and, and I said, um, she said, this is my new house. <laughs> and I said, did you pick out your bedroom yet? And she goes, oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's just it's very heartwarming um, to see. And what a, what a neat, um, what, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Uh, just working together. We are building a house, helping build a house, but you really, it reminds me of Habitat for Humanity. We're providing a life for these people, opportunities that they might not have otherwise. So uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for that. And um, I read in the paper the other day about the Adams Garden, and I know some of our schools have the different community gardens, but as a gardener myself, I just read through that and appreciate all the opportunities for learning and fun that the students and staff are having. Um, so, you know, our teachers go above and beyond and our parents and our administrators, everyone, to support these programs. I can't, I can't thank you enough. And lastly, I'm looking forward to graduation. 20 years I've been going to graduations and I might not be too hot this year, so <laughs> um, I'm looking forward to 82 it. 82 degrees the last time. I know. As long as there's a breeze <laughs> and I'm in the shade, I am good. Can't be hotter than being in the school. So congratulations to all our graduates, whether they're going off to college or into the military, into the workforce. Um, you've worked hard and you deserve it. And so do your parents and everybody that helped you along the way. Hmm. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, I'll try not to repeat any of the great news that was shared already. A few things that I wanted to hit on. Um, tonight we talked about diversity and inclusion. And a few years ago, uh, Mr. Shero and I were talking about diversity and inclusion. And I joined the Cultural Awareness Committee through the Middle and Area Community Foundation. I've been going there for two years. And it's a group of community members. We've got Northwood representation, public schools representation. Uh, the mayor is in that group, as well as many other community members. And the goal of that is really to understand where our community is with a diversity in our community and how we can help make our community more of a welcoming community. And we've been working hard at that for a couple years, but I'm really proud that we've got Midland Public Schools representation in that group and that we are, are living in a community where there is so much um, 
pride of place and wanting to improve and, and wanting to be a more welcoming place for all. I want to thank all of our speakers tonight for coming up and sharing and um, inquiring and, and with the, the thought that you put into your inquiry. It is appreciated. And um, I agree with you, Lynn, that, um, and I want to say that again, is, is we take what you say and, and these decisions that we make are not decisions that we just make without thoughtful consideration and looking in depth at detail. And, and many decisions are, are tough. I mean, we've got people on both sides of, of the, the, the issue, and, and we have to weigh those things. Uh, when, when we talk about the part-time Indian, um, we, we all read the book, and I think I asked eight eight friends to read the book too and we, we reported back and, and we took the request very seriously and, and when we have lots of community members coming to us from both sides we have to pause and we have to look at it again and make sure that we're okay with the process and one thing that helps is a process and that's one that's what I have to give this administration credit for is really creating a solid process and um, Mr. Brutin and what you've done to lead us in this way. I know uh, you were put in a, in a tough position when you have, have uh, so much, um, so many different um, uh, ideas in a community. And it's, it's really tough to, to have to come up with a solution that's good for all. And good for all doesn't mean everybody's going to agree. But I want to thank you for for leading that effort, and I know it's tough, and I know everyone's not going to agree all the time, but we certainly appreciate uh, your leadership in that area, and, and we'll take thoughtful consideration as we move forward as well. Um, when we talk about the preschool, uh, again, Mike, about four years ago, I think it was, he asked our board to get involved what, in what was called um, Exploring Our Futures, Midland County. And what this was, was envisioning what we could be in 20 years in our county. And part of that was over 100 community members coming together with ideas on what we can do to make our community great again. And, and then we took the top issues, and do you know the, num the second top issue was around education, it was around preschool, and it was about getting more kids to preschool. So I've spent the last three years on a committee working on how can we get more kids in our community in a high quality preschool. And it, it, um, I, I would love to be able to offer choice to all that would be wonderful, and Midland has such a reputation for allowing choice uh, in this community. Um, sadly, it costs money, and, and to, to get to garner that kind of um, financial support in order to offer a choice to all um, for preschool is very tough. And, um, we need to, to come up with solutions on how can we as a community bring more preschoolers into our, or more kindergartners into kindergarten who are ready to learn. And it's, it's much better, and there's research across the board that says if they have high quality preschool, then they will be, do better. So as a board, as an administration, we know that we're trying to close the gap. And we're, gonna, we're trying to do that with the resources that we have. And it's challenging. And again, not everyone's going to agree with how that happens. But I'll rest assured that everyone on this board and the administration wants to do what's best for kids. And we're going to make choices on what we believe is best for kids. But we certainly appreciate your thought and your thoughtfulness coming forward and sharing your ideas and uh, in a respectful manner. And hopefully you found uh, us uh, respectful as well. Um, I guess the last thing uh, is the bond funds. I just want to say that uh, Midland schools were working hard uh, to accomplish great things with those bond funds. The bond language is being carried out in full. 
more than half the work from series one uh, has been completed. And this has only been possible because of the careful attention and the rigorous diligence of our MPS leadership. The great progress is possible because the community trusts us and invests our bond funds in a way that follows the bond language and that best meets the needs of the individual school buildings. Because of our detail-oriented diligence throughout the process, we have identified innovative ways to address unexpected surprises, accomplish more with less, and even at times find ways to enhance improvements. Building by building, decision-making is standard operating procedure within bond parameters. We are grateful for the community's confidence as we administer the bond, taking into consideration the changing cost of materials and supplies and making adjustments based on the unique needs of the structures and ages of our building. We are committed to transparency regarding the bond, which is why we continue to post on our website information about spending, progress toward goals, and lists of current priorities. And out of all the people I know, if there's one person, if there's anyone out there that is transparent, it's Mr. Sherrill. He's the most transparent, honest person I've ever met. So I have complete and utter confidence in his leadership in this and know that, that we are diligent in, in our work with the bond as well. And thank you for your support in that. Mr. Sherrill? <clears throat> I'm going to be long too. Sorry about this. We're going to make, we're going to make set some times here, but a few things I do need to say on the book. One of the things I want teachers to realize is uh, somebody before us set some incredible processes, and if you remember, the book process went all the way through, and this board approved that book. So when you get a little bit angst towards the board, realize that they approved that book after going through all the steps and the processes going there. When we were alerted, kind of late, that there was some um, maybe language that we should be called attention to, I went to the board and had all seven of them read the book. And I have to tell you, my personal opinion was I thought they'd come back and say, hey, maybe we got ourselves where we shouldn't. They, but they stood by you, all seven of them, and said, no, this, the book should go forward. But it was challenged, and I keep hearing by a few, 150. And so, I, you know, and I'm sure there's 150 on the other side. Um, and so we found ourselves in a sticky sti situation where, um, to be honest, I predicted it to the board mm -hmm. that we were going to be in, caught in the middle one day um, and we were going to have to decide what to do. There's a challenge process in the school district to all curriculum materials. And so your question, could it happen to a, some other piece of content? It could. There, there is a challenge process to our community because our parents demand choice. They demand a say in their child's education. So it came forward, and this is where we are at now. By the way, I'm kind of half thinking that um, I'm hearing you challenge. You maybe you should need to have someone challenge for you uh, on the process going forward. So that's the book. Um, we certainly are not in the middle of trying to disrespect any teachers. It, it's a sticky wicket all the way through, um, and the processes were all the way follow all the way through. Um, bond funds. So Mr. Yaki, um, because we. As I've said before, we deal very um, legal manner with Mr. Yaki. Um, he, he did FOIA, um, and we did provide answers. Every answer that we provided is on our website to every single question that he asked. Every building has received the full dollar amount that was ever said to be spent on it. Every dollar amount. Now, somewhere along the line, we're going to get caught where the dollar amount doesn't cover everything you desire. If you've ever built a home, you borrow 200000 and you take your wish list, and somewhere you come overpriced, and you reduce the lighting scope, or you do make some choices, or you pull some out of your savings to add to the building of that. So we have many tough, tough decisions to make as we go forward. And let me correct Mr. Yaki, because he always says, I have things wrong. He has things wrong. It wasn't passed in 15. It was passed in 14. So four years ago, many things have changed. When we finish to work three or four years from now, over eight years, many prices and pieces will change that. I do ask anyone who has any doubt to go to our website, contact Pam or I. I'm more than glad to answer any question you would have on the bond. 
um, but every single dollar in every building has been spent um, of the work that's completed. By the way, we have open houses advertised. Come see the buildings. We'll walk you around. We'll show you the work that was done and show you that um, we, we certainly met um, the criteria of doing that piece going forward. Um, GSRP. So, Mrs. Ringwald, I've met with you a couple times, and hopefully you see that we want to accomplish what you want. And um, hopefully you'll see, just as I did on the book or in the material, Mrs. Vanette, I have gone out and done much research already on this. And I have to tell you, I'm not seeing an answer here. The answer, the only answer I can come to every time I hear you hear you talk about it is I need to disband and get rid of the tuition program. It's the only way that I I could fix it, because GSRP is state funded. They have many many regulations, and I have asked regional and state partners this, at this point. I've even had a legislature get involved, and they all say to me, "Run! There's no way you're going to fix this problem." But um, we are we are on that and trying to meet that, and in doing so. Um, our Young Five programs are already IBPYP. Our tuition program is already IBPYP. We've already committed now to do IBPYP in our GSRP program. By the way, when we say different curriculum, both our tuition program and our GSRP use the same curriculum. Right now, creative. My understanding is the state may be getting rid of creative curriculum. We'll follow that as we go. But um, right now, we use creative curriculum in both programs. And if we add the IBPYP, the curriculum will be the same. So we're, we're moving that way. One program's four days, one's five. I still got a little problem there. Um, but, but certainly, if you, if you look at the rules and regulations, there's not a fix to that one right now. Um, it's a major, major hit to the point where we probably couldn't run our early childhood program. And, and let me say that too. Most public schools only run a GSRP program. They do not run a tuition. So we could make the rationale, maybe we shouldn't have it. But those parents don't qualify for GSR, GSRP. And we saw there was a need, many were asking for that. Um, a type of program ran through the public school system. And so uh, I know Scott took advantage of that early when we did it, and he was very passionate about it. Coming up on my third child. Going third, <laughs> <laughs> we like those families. Um, <laughs> but we, we are on it, and we are working on it as well. And um, I think we're more nervous still, though. It makes you understand it's just getting the doors open on that 100-year-old building and having it ready for those children, 100% ready when we can go next year. So on that as well. Um, Tentative agreement with uh, Midland Fair Specials. I see their leadership here tonight. And so when Pam mentioned closed session, we go into closed session to inform the full board. Because the uh, HR committee got the uh, uh, rundown of it, but the full board gets the information. But we do not act on it tonight. It's just an information, and we go and close to it because they have not ratified yet. So when they vote and ratify, then we're able to talk about it publicly and come out. So there'll be no action tonight. It's informing you. So when they're ratified, are you ratifying early June, gals? I don't remember. June 6th? So June 11, we'll probably put it on our June 11 board since we have two in June, and that's what we'll, we'll actually act on their contract. Okay? We'll give you guys the full details, but we can't give the public it yet until they ratify. Um, I did go to Dimensions of Diversity Training through uh, Dow Chemical. They invited um, several Great Lakes Bay Region leaders along with some of their site leaders throughout the country, and we met. Uh, um, they paid the bill, so don't worry, because Pam knows how I don't like to travel on, on school district dollars. Um, and I was even questioning if I wanted them to pay the bill, but Pam says I should go. And so we went to uh, Washington, D.C., and we started at, at the African American um, Smithsonian Museum, and we held our meeting in there afterwards on it. And it's a start. It's a good start um, about uh, where we want to go, educate ourselves a little bit about inclusion um, and diversity. And um, so we're bringing back a little bit of an action plan. We're going to meet again in the, in the area. It's going to be a Great Lakes Bay Regional Inclusion Plan and see if we um, can move our communities forward. Um, I think one of the powerful things, when you, if, you, if you get a chance to go to D.C. and go through that museum, is the thought that the only way we're going to move forward is to do that together. And so, uh, um, you know, we're going to have to work together in order to do those pieces of it. Um, you guys talked about the trade school, and um, we're going to be probably bringing something together with you as well. Working a little bit with the city and Bill Brown. Um, if, if you know, we've 
at times ran into funding issues with that program and the cost and many of our local contractors assist us on some of that. Bill Brown that works for the city and that partnership is incredible. I don't know how much longer Bill's got and um, finding that property in the city is an issue. And so a thought that I've floated out there and I think some of you have heard me talk about it is if we take Franklin down at some point, could that um, be used for a building trades program some of that property? But by the way, also if we could gain some uh, income from them building on a lot, gain that property, do we kind of invest it in the, maybe like a community foundation and now we've supported that program going forward forever in supporting the cost of that program where we would need to go. It's, you wouldn't lose the value of that property. It's just coming in and you're placing it to support your building's trades go forward. So a uh, lot of work to do on there. We'll bring that through the committee. Bill, Bill brought it up again today and uh, he's even got some drawings and stuff he wants to show me. So he's a little further down the road than I am. So I thought I'd better mention it tonight um, going forward. But I think that could be something really good. Uh, school safety and response training. And so if you've, um, we had another incident last Friday and thoughts and prayers out to Santa Fe. Um, pretty close to me because I know exactly where that high school is after I spent 11 years down that area. Um, and so um, it just keep, keeps growing. And if you know, if you, we have legislation in Lansing to support what we believe um, are the right things. And a lot of organizations have signed on that. You, you may have saw Scott Stevenson's um, letter to that or today and um, supporting that legislation as well. So the sheriffs, the police association, social worker association, um, school board, superintendents, everyone's kind of signed on to this legislation. And it's a combination of everything we're talking about from more need for school social work, more proactive approach to keeping kids healthy, um, but certainly also the hardening of the target and some of those things going forward. So um, one of the things I, I continue to propose to you is we got to get an instant messaging system where we can alert our staff quickly. Um, we also need school resource, more school resource officers. Um, we know we have an enhancement millage renewal coming up. I think we should talk about that and, and that enhancement millage continually about increasing um, those things, but we certainly need school resource or um, social worker and those pieces of it and we need to keep lobbying Lansing you know they had a little bit of a um, surplus to in the last revenue and so our push is um, to use that for the school safety legislation side of that as we go forward um, staff lunch visits you know I've been doing those for a while and so this year is a I moved it up to a fall and spring been going very well and I really enjoy out, those out talking to staff and having a good time there um, I bring to you, I remember uh, a few weeks ago that we lost our state superintendent, Brian Winston, and there was no better champion for children than Brian Winston. I have to get to know Brian when he was a lobbyist many years ago for the education group, and um, then when he was a superintendent in Dearborn, and boy, it hits home when he's six days younger than I am, and he passes, and you go, whoa. And, but he, that was a big loss to the state, and so our state, um, like another piece for that will be to find a quality leader in that school state superintendent position as we go forward. Open houses um, at those schools, um, we'll advertise those. Um, Mary asked about maybe getting them out to those residents who don't read our um, newsletters, so we'll have to work on that little bit of it, but um, we'll have those in June as well. Graduation plans, um, today we uh, got an update from Midland High. Uh, we're getting some from Dow High for you as well for how, where you're going because you're going to a new place. And so when we basically when you get to um, Dow Diamond, we'll be meeting um, a little bit behind the stadium on the first base side where you would come in like as a groundskeeper through there. And we'll be entering um, with the students. Some who go to the stage will be going to the stage and those who don't go to the stage will be going sitting with the uh, staff. And so um, and keep praying for sunshine right now. It looks real good. So <laughs> let's keep it going that way. Um, Kirsch Stacker Awards, congratulations to our teachers. We held it for the first time at our newly renovated center auditorium. I thought it went well. Um, thank you, committee, for all the work they did to that. Um, and of course, that is just always a great event going forward. Pre primary school, um, we're, we're kind of up and getting closer and closer in there. If you want to take a tour, let me know. We'll go take you in. Um, flooring should be going in soon, colors and painting are there. Um, it's getting closer. You can start seeing the vision a little bit there. I think. Still got a lot of work, but we have a few months still to go on those pieces of it. Um, and back to that topic, one of the things that we are exploring, and Pam mentioned it well. Pam's been on this, <clears throat> by the way, for a long time. Dick delinsky has been on this for a long time. And we just recently got turned down for dollars for scholarships. And when I say we, it was a, a county approach. Mm -hmm. um, we got turned down on that. But we're, we're, we'll continue to seek scholarship funds where we could do that intertwining if we get some scholarship funds to do it 
that way and so that wouldn't be a blocker to us doing it I don't think um, as well going forward with that um, Center Park won another design award, third for it. So, and it was very nice to see a very trying first year in Central Park and see that power of what we're doing right there tonight. You saw some of that. So I really was really impressed with that piece of it. Um, educational leaders keep requesting to see um, Central Park. We've brought, I think, just about every superintendent in the world, uh, uh, <laughs> universities through, and now we've brought Delta College leadership through it just recently. So very impressed by that. And I will close on that piece of it. Great, great, thank you. All right, now we will go into closed session. And when we come out, all we'll do is adjourn the meeting. So if you don't want to stick around, you don't have to. But if you want to come out and see me hammer down on the table, yeah. then you're more than welcome to. Can, can we sign? You guys need, you need signatures, signature. right? Oh, and if yeah, you need signatures, we'll do those, come on those now. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. It's okay.